Okay, good morning. We'll come to order. How are we how are we doing on the World Wide Web? We are currently live, Chairman Harshman. Oh, beautiful. Okay, meeting will come to order. Uh, Ms. Cruz, can you please call the roll? Representatives Baker. Here. Gray. Here. Hallinan. Here. Henderson. Here. Jennings. Here. Roscoe. Here. Sweeney. Here. Yen. Here. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Nine present, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Very good, thank you. Uh, appreciate folks joining us. We wanted to, we frankly ran out of time. We had a hard stop, as you recall, and uh, we want to make sure we've uh, heard from all the public that wants to testify. And uh, so we really, we don't have a motion yet on a bill and we've been taking public testimony really on the solar. Uh, we had uh, the good majority floor leader explain his bill and but we've really been taking testimony on both the uh, solar generation taxation the house bill 94 and the wind energy production tax of 108 and uh, so i have folks online i think uh i'm going to reverse the order why we have good internet we're going to start with the folks online and i made that mistake last time i started with folks in the room and then we went down for a while so uh who do we have out there that is ready to join us mr like, chairman i have a ms kara coquette uh coquette choquette um i will admit and then if you would like to instruct any other any of the other Zoom attendees who would like to testify to raise their hand, I can admit them in order. Okay, that'd be wonderful. So folks online, you can raise your little Zoom hand and that'll order you in the order that you raised them. And uh, we'll just start admitting you and, and we'd love to hear from you. Morning, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, we Thank can. You. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with the committee today and thank you for taking testimony uh, via Zoom as well. Um, I did try to sign up yesterday, but I do appreciate you ran out of time and um, appreciate the chance to talk with you. Um, again, for the record, my name is Kara Shoket. I work for two different companies, Power Company of Wyoming, which is developing a very large wind farm south of Rollins in Carbon County as well as TransWest Express, which is developing a very large, again, interregional transmission system to try to connect Wyoming to brand new markets that the state is not currently serving today. So um, both of these companies are part of the Anschutz Corporation. You may know us best through Anschutz Exploration Corporation, very active in the Powder River Basin, uh, particularly in Campbell County and Converse County over the years. And with these projects, we're now seeing the resource development opportunity in Carbon County. And again, a chance to um, target and attract new markets in the desert Southwest um, that have an appetite for renewable energy, um, but certainly don't have to buy renewable energy from Wyoming. And that's the projects we've been working on uh, for the past 13 years. So um, I, Appreciate, I got a chance to listen to a lot of the testimony yesterday um, and don't really wanna repeat what was said by the many people who said, please don't increase taxes again on wind energy. I think I, it's, it's really great to hear that you're willing to uh, take the time to hear kind of that history and context of all the discussions that have been happening since 2016 on this subject. Um, so I just wanna make, I guess, four kind of key points for you today and please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. This is a very large complex uh, topic we've been talking about and um, again really appreciate the opportunity to address um, any questions and provide information as, as you go forward in your decision making. Um, first, one thing that's really important to talk about that hasn't been discussed so far is there's a really big difference between an independent energy developer like us and projects that are owned by a rate regulated utility such as Rocky Mountain Power or um, uh, Cheyenne Power and Light. So that the, in short, the challenges are completely different. The opportunities are completely different and so are the risks. We do not have an automatic customer or an automatic market for the power that we can generate and deliver from Wyoming to these new markets. So 
we are trying to play this very different role within the overall energy ecosystem. And that's a wholesale power provider. So as a wholesale power provider, that's why these cost conversations are so important because we are working to be selected. We're competing in this big, huge market, working to be selected by utilities and by other entities to have this power selected as part of their purchase contract. So that is why the price discussion is so critical and so important because if our projects, if our product isn't selected, then the project can't go forward. And we've, and we've talked a lot about that over the past few years about a, a proposed project is not a built project. The projects you've seen go forward in 2020, it's really important to recognize basically five of the six projects, those new um, wind projects that um, ACP talked to you about on Tuesday, are owned or had contracts with rate regulated utilities. So they had the certainty of a market, the certainty of a customer. So when you look at this realm, it's really important to distinguish between the challenges that are faced by an independent developer like us and by the rate regulated utilities. Um, the second point I would make that hasn't been talked about yet is the wind that is within the rate regulated utility portfolio when that, so we're talking about the, the generation tax is a tax applied at the wholesale level. So that unit of wind energy production, that unit doesn't have any value in and of itself, right? It has to be passed through transmission, through billing. There's all sorts of additional costs that go in when the rate regulated utility sends you that final bill. So if you look at your bill in Casper and you see from Rocky Mountain Power, there's already at the point of sale of electricity, a 6% sales tax applied on the retail sale of electricity. So there's already this wholesale tax applied and there's a, re a, a retail tax that's applied on the retail sale of electricity. That's a tax that you pay as consumers, as rate payers, um, when the electricity is delivered to you as a final product. So I just thought that was important to recognize that sales tax at the point of retail sale. The third thing I wanna just talk about is how unique our projects are. There is no other wind and transmission proposal like this in the country. We've been working for 12 years, 13 years, sorry, 12 years for me <laughs> on these projects to move them forward. It's a very, very difficult, very big uphill lift to try to not only create this whole new market for Wyoming energy to the West, not buying coal today, we don't compete with Powder River Basin coal whatsoever, so create that new market, develop this path to the market in the form of transmission, which has a, again, lots of time permitting costs to consider, as well as then to create a cost competitive generation resource that the market may be willing to buy. And so that's what we've been working on uh, over the past 13 years, added with the complexity of doing business on federal lands. The vast majority of wind projects in the United States, there's 122,000 megawatts of renewable energy installed nationwide. Wyoming has now about 2,700 megawatts, so about 2% of the overall national installed wind capacity is in Wyoming. But of that installed capacity, less than 1% is on federal lands. It's, as any of you know who have worked on any energy projects on federal lands, it's a lot more um, complex. It's time consuming, it's costly. We've worked successfully through all of those projects. Um, we are at the point now, we're constructing the wind farm. We're almost there uh, with TransWest and have a lot of exciting uh, progress and milestones there. Um, so if our projects are successful, and I, that's the vision that we have is we want these projects to be successful in Carbon County and for Wyoming. And if we are, our projects together will deliver over $1.1 billion in new diverse, non-mineral revenue for Wyoming. And the non-mineral revenue part is really important. Any of you who watch the Craig Report closely know, increasing the amount of non-mineral property tax revenue is really critical and helpful for Wyoming. Property taxes are what go to fund schools. And that's what wind projects really, the, the cake of the taxes that we're looking at here is in the form of property taxes. If our projects go forward, over construction in their initial lives, we estimate over 500 million of that money will go to Wyoming schools. And if you look just at wind projects, the University of Wyoming did a study in 2016, looking at what if 6,100 megawatts of new wind came to Wyoming? Our project was among those that they looked at. Of those 6,100 megawatts of new wind power, 
they estimated that would generate almost $2 billion in, again, new mineral, not, new non-mineral revenue for Wyoming. And of that, $721 million would go to fund Wyoming schools. So it's just a way, a point of reiterating, again, what you heard on Tuesday is that there's far more revenue to be gained for the state by leaving taxes at the stable and current level, helping projects like ours go forward and be successful at doing business in Wyoming. Um, the last point I wanted to make that also hasn't been brought up so far is, and <laughs> Representative Jennings may remember this from 2016, one way to get more revenue for Wyoming is to have the state get a greater share of the federal royalties that we will have to pay for the use of federal lands interspersed throughout our project. And so in 2016, we talked about rather than increasing the taxes on a project like ours, let's work together and try to get a greater share of the money that we already project paying in the form of federal royalties. So we help support the revenue committee, which carried forward a resolution that was then signed in the 2017 general session by the governor, unanimously passed through the House and the Senate, that would call for uh, essentially federal revenue sharing to make sure that at least 50% of the money that we pay in the form of federal rents and fees and royalties comes back to Wyoming. Right now, that's what happens with oil and gas and coal and I think geothermal as well. And we have been working diligently since 2016 to try to get that passed in federal legislation. So this resolution, um, Senate Joint Resolution 2 from the 2017 general session, is something that called on Congress to make that revenue sharing happen. Um, we've been working um, in DC trying to get that uh, provision passed. We're very happy to see that provision was included in bipartisan le legislation called the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act. Um, the revenue sharing provision was in there that would provide for 50% of that money to come back to Wyoming and its counties. Unfortunately, Florida, despite the bipartisan support did not pass. However, we have a chance now in the new Congress and we continue to work diligently to get that federal revenue sharing provision. So that again, 50% of the money that we pay to the federal government will come back to Wyoming. And if we can make that happen and in this Congress, there's a, a much better chance that we can see that happen uh, fairly soon, that would deliver another $90 million estimated to Wyoming because you would be getting that re federal revenue sharing. So there's other, so the point we discussed in 2016 and have tried to keep our commitment and move forward is to try to get more money for Wyoming from the existing revenues we already anticipate paying and bringing that back to the state. Um, just two other quick points. There were some comments brought up yesterday about, uh, or questions brought up yesterday uh, about Texas. Texas has over 33,000 megawatts of renewable energy, of wind energy installed as of the end of 2020. Um, Wyoming is about 2,700 megawatts right now. Um, of interest in the fourth quarter, Texas installed about 2,100 megawatts of new wind power. So just in the fourth quarter, they installed almost as much as what Wyoming has um, installed to date. So um, the other point I would just point out is I think the federal production tax credit came up a couple of times. And the point is, and this is again reflected in the University of Wyoming study, that's a federal incentive available to all wind projects in all parts of the country. It's essentially zeroed out then when you look at how do we compete from a state tax perspective. So if we get the production tax credit, it is only a 10 year tax credit that lasts. And um, again, it goes to lower the price of power, help us be competitive, help us get selected for purchase in these markets as well as to help us pay the cost of transmission. It's not a surprise to anyone in the resource business in Wyoming. We're so blessed with resources in Wyoming, but we're distant from the market and there's a cost to get to those markets. It has to be contemplated and looking at the whole uh, economic situation and portfolio. So um, I, I'm guessing you have a lot of questions. I'm happy to answer them. I've been working on these issues, as I mentioned, since 2009. I sat through all five meetings of the very first wind task force of 2009, where all these issues of taxation and regulation, how they've changed. Um, Matt Michael, I talked a little bit yesterday, or I'm sorry, on Tuesday about all the projects that were on the drawing board back then that, that never came to fruition. And so I'm very happy to try to answer questions about our projects, but to the extent that can be helpful on the kind of that broader historical context, I think you were interested in, I'm happy to help with that as well. Okay, very good, thank you. Members, any questions? Okay, appreciate you joining us today. Um, any questions, Representative Roscoe? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Joquette, could you explain to me, just because I don't understand, uh, how your company works with the, uh, the transmission part of this equation? Thank Go you, ahead. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Ms. Joquette. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Roscoe, for that question. So again, we're very unusual among companies. The Anschutz Corporation has two different companies. Power Company of Wyoming is uniquely and specifically focused on developing the wind energy resource. Separately, TransWest Express is working on developing the TransWest Express transmission project, the 732 mile line that again would uh, connect Wyoming to new markets in the desert Southwest, um, California, Arizona, Nevada, kind of in that whole Hoover Dam area. So they're separate projects and um, have gone forward really seeing that there was a unique purpose and need for each of those projects when we started the permitting in 2008. So um, the, the TransWest project I think has unique value for Wyoming in that, you know, today is the market, what the market wants today is wind. Wind is what will get this type of infrastructure built for Wyoming. But looking ahead, uh, uh, playing chess, looking ahead into the future, what are the resources that Wyoming could have that would be eligible to deliver into that market into the future? And that's where you see some of the work coming in potentially from the carbon capture research, for example. There's, there's an opportunity in California, not just to sell renewable resources, but also zero carbon resources. And if that zero carbon resource becomes eligible, we need the pathway to connect Wyoming to those markets to get there. So the, the transmission line is, is really the long-term asset for Wyoming, just like the Ruby pipeline has delivered gas to external markets and the railroads deliver Wyoming coal to markets. In this non-mineral electricity market, we still need that, that critical pathway for the electricity resources of today and then what, what Wyoming may be able to provide in generation tomorrow. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for joining us. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have as they go along. And I guess I would just add, if Very there's sorry. anything you hear after me that makes you think this tax is justified, please give me an opportunity to address it. I really would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, who do we have next online? I'll admit Mr. Dan Neal. Okay. And folks, I'll just remind everybody, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a hard stop on this, these issues. At some point, we're gonna have to vote on this. And so I'm looking at nine o'clock because we got some other bills. And so now it's all, it's uh, 818. So we'd like to um, uh, wrap it up about before nine o'clock. Thank you. Mr. Neal, are you on there? I don't see I'm it. on here. I'm looking to get my video on. There you are. Okay. Very good. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman Harshman uh, and committee. My name is Dan Neal. I'm speaking to you today. On behalf of the Wyoming Energy Forum, it's a coalition of Wyoming people concerned about the pace and impact of renewable energy development in Wyoming. Uh, we support Representative Hallinan's proposal to increase the production tax and to repeal the three-year uh, exemption. We also support passage of House Bill 94, uh, uh, imposing the same tax on solar power production. Uh, as you guys know, Wyoming for decades has taxed uh, energy producers here to generate funds to address each industry's impacts on the state and its resources. Uh, these revenues help finance the infrastructure such as roads and highways that help the companies build and operate their projects. Uh, the taxes also help ensure the ability of the state and its communities to provide the companies with the services and public safety services, particularly that they need. Industry opposes the tax, uh, we get that, but disagree with their continuing claims that for some reason the legislature should end its efforts uh, to uh, tax the industry. Uh, I wanna particularly address this, this idea that, that uh, industry needs uh, an absolutely stable tax environment to function uh, in the market. Uh, the states heard those same arguments for years uh, back in the late 60s and 70s uh, when the state started talking about imposing a severance tax. Uh, this is one of the first arguments that came up is that if you impose a severance tax on coal or on oil and gas, these projects will go elsewhere. Uh, that's the nature of corporations. Their object is to protect the bottom line. 
our object and, and yours is to make sure that the state's interests are met. So, uh, you know, you can look back at history and see that Governor Hathaway, Governor Herschler, the legislators of the late 60s and 70s uh, understood that and they imposed a tax and they didn't, they didn't oppose one tax and then stop. They kept looking at what the state needed and then adjusted uh, those taxes as necessary. So uh, the first severance tax on all mineral production in the state was 1%. Uh, in the early 70s, a severance tax of 2% was imposed on coal uh, or on oil and gas. Uh, when the big coal boom opened up, uh, a severance tax was imposed on coal production. These taxes have gone up. Uh, the standard tax now on oil and gas is 6%. Uh, you know that uh, taxes on coal have really fluctuated. They've gone from up to as high as 10 and a half percent over the years. So uh, the legislature's always adjusted its tax regime to meet the needs of the state. Uh, the companies have always said that if you do that, uh, they will have to take their uh, their mines or their uh, production facilities elsewhere. Uh, uh, as you all know, despite those severance taxes and a, a very tax regime in the uh, 70s and 80s for all those uh, big energy producers, the state uh, prospered and those mineral producers stayed here and they prospered as well because the resources are here. And, you know, I know you all know that Wyoming has rich wind resources companies will come here to exploit that. We should be sure that we're getting the revenues we need to support our communities and also to compensate uh, ourselves and the people who will be here in the future for the lost uh, open landscapes, the impacts on wildlife and uh, so many other things that uh, we all take for granted now in this state that are slowly uh, being eroded for the people that will come after us. Uh, so these companies operate in an environment in Wyoming uh, that comparative to other states, I mean, you know, we have a very low sales tax rate. Our property tax rates are very low. We don't charge an income tax. Uh, these direct taxes on production are how we uh, raise revenues for the state. So uh, and th this production tax will become more important over time as uh, the property value of these projects depreciate over time. As you know, the Department of Revenue now uh, uses a state straight line formula that uh, depreciates these projects over about 20 years. So though the, the revenues are fairly high at the start of, of a, a particular facility's life, uh, they decline uh, over time. So if we can, capture revenues from production, uh, the state is assured that it can still meet the needs, not only of its own citizens, but these companies themselves that need this basic infrastructure to operate. Uh, we understand the enticement of a sudden infusion of activity and sales tax revenue, but uh, we think we need to plan for the longer term. Let's, let's think about the next 50 to 100 years, not just the next two. Uh, I think we should raise the tax. Uh, we know that utilities and their developers will, in, uh, other wind developers will internalize the cost, which means they're consumers. And the large majority of them, as you know, are outside Wyoming, will pick up the tab. We think the tax represents a one step in an effort to figure out how to ensure that the wind power industry pays its fair share of state operations and contributes to the protection of the Wyoming we love. Uh, we support House Bill 94 for the same reason. Uh, state needs these uh, revenues to meet the demands of the companies on its infrastructure and for public safety and other services. I do have one question that I'd pose and I hope you consider as you deliberate both these bills and that's if you approve this tax increase on wind power production, will the same increase apply under the uh, statutes revised if you pass the uh, solar tax? So I just 
leave that question with you to think about. Uh, anyway, that's our point of view. We'll hope you'll support this tax and get it to the floor where we can have an even more robust debate. So thank you and I'll try to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Neal. Okay, any questions? And they are linked uh, if 94 passes. Okay, thank you for joining us. Okay, who's next that we have in the waiting room? Mr. Chairman, I'll admit Ms. Maria White. Very good. Seems like we're not going to admit Miss White. Oh, so I'm there. Miss I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can't see you. Okay, there. I think I just turned my video on. There we go. Okay. All right. Hi. Miss, we have about a half. Um, hour. Thank you. We have about a half hour. Yes. So if you can introduce yourself and and give us any comments that haven't already been said, that'd be great. So appreciate you joining us. Thank you. No problem. Um, my name is Mariah White. I am a resident of Albany County. I have come before you in support of increasing the tax on wind energy and solar and removing the three year tax break. Um, there are two guarantees in life, taxes and death. <laughs> taxes rise. With the new federal administration, the wind industry stands to glean even more federal tax credits than ever before. When Wyoming pays the high price of decimating our land and the state needs to be better compensated. The financial situation that the state finds itself in could be helped by this tax increase. In speaking to my local government, they are most worried about 2023 and beyond because of the trickle down effect. Ironically, that is exactly when these bills would benefit the state the most. The wind industry threatens that they will not come to Wyoming anymore. I say hogwash. That's what every industry and individual person might say when faced with higher taxes. But the reality is that the wind industry has other reasons to come to Wyoming. They are attracted to Wyoming's loose regulations that allow them to place wind farms close to anywhere they want. They are also coming because of our world-class wind. There are so many negative consequences of wind and solar industrializations, many not realized until decades later. At the time when the state realizes that they long sold, uh, they, they sold long-term prosperity for the short-term goal gains through low taxes on renewables. I say support this bill and give the general legislature an opportunity to decide if they need more revenue to balance budget cuts coming from an industry that can well afford it. Thank you for your time. Okay, any questions for Ms. White? Okay, we thank you for joining us today. Very good. Okay, who do we have next? Do we? Mr. Chairman, I'll admit Mr. Tom Christensen. Morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tom Christensen. I live in Green River, and my family has uh, maintained continuous residence in Wyoming since 1885. Uh, I'm gonna. I've shortened my comments here uh, in deference to others uh, behind, um, but I would like to say that our our collective future demands that energy development and use becomes cleaner and absolutely sustainable. Wind energy has been shown to be sustainable, relatively clean, cost-effective, and profitable, but not without undesirable impacts. Science conducted here in Wyoming and around the globe has demonstrated impacts to many species of wildlife from industrial scale wind development and the associated infrastructure. 
As wind energy development expands, which it certainly will, the impacts associated with it will unquestionably increase. Yet our knowledge of the impacts of wind energy development to wildlife is incomplete. Much remains unknown, not only in terms of describing and quantifying the impacts, but in how to mitigate them as well. I support House Bill 108 as well as 94. However, I also suggest amending 108 to earmark a portion of the tax revenue, perhaps 10% of the anticipated general fund receipts, uh, not the county receipts, uh, towards research to better understand wind energy development impacts to wildlife and most importantly, how to mitigate them. Uh, I will end there and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Mr. Christensen, 1885, that's impressive. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony today. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll admit Jennifer Kirchhofer. I think everyone here in present in the room has already testified. Is that right? Is there anybody here that would like that hasn't testified? That would okay. It looks like two, three. Okay. Hi, there we are. No. Hello, good morning. My name is Jennifer Kirchhofer, and I'm part of Albany County for Smart Energy Development. And I am testifying in support of House Bill 108 to raise the tax imposed on wind generation and eliminate the tax exemption wind companies take advantage of at our expense. Industrial wind companies are highly experienced in choosing locations with tax exemptions and insufficient zoning regulations. Also very skilled in supplying overinflated monetary promises and job numbers to win over county officials, pressuring them to ignore the extensive negative consequences. As long as big wind is allowed to play the system, pressure, deceive, and overwhelm county officials and capital relies on tax exemptions and subsidies, they have free reign to destroy the unique Western character of Wyoming. The reason we came here as visitors and tourists and chose Wyoming as our home. The burden should not lay on local residents to spearhead this fight to retain all that keeps Wyoming great, especially without fair compensation for this permanent destruction. Passing this bill would put wind energy taxation more in line with taxes paid by other energy producers. Opponents say, tax, say increasing the tax will push project developers elsewhere Legislators have heard this many times before by oil, gas, coal, and other extractive industries. They too stated that they would take their business elsewhere, yet those industries stayed in Wyoming and prospered despite substantial and well-deserved increases in tax rates, regardless of their individual business struggles. Tax benefits are clearly not needed anymore to attract industrial wind development. Wyoming is already giving them a green light in counties with outdated regulations that lag behind industry advancements. It's time we change that light to yellow, causing industrial wind developers to proceed with caution, to choose locations where wind is properly sited and not where small communities are forced to exchange wind development payments for decreased tourism, stagnated growth, and reductions in hunting revenue. Currently, wind companies are paying millions to fight against non-participating landowners in order to force their projects into poor locations. If wind developers use caution, when choosing properly cited locations, they could easily afford the dollar per megawatt hour tax increase instead of directing those funds towards battling resistance from local communities. We need to proceed with caution and consider the consequences of selling out Wyoming for unsustainable and unreliable energy sources. It's time we bring accountability into the equation. There is a price for doing business in Wyoming and big wins should be held accountable for paying that price from day one. Some things aren't for sale, but when it is regrettably required, our valuable Wyoming land comes at a premium and we deserve to be fully compensated. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Any questions from Ms. Kirchhoff? Okay, thank you for joining us today. Mr. Chairman, I'll admit Mark Isley. There, we on board? Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Mark Isley. I'm the owner and operator of the King Ranch uh, west of Cheyenne. And I'm one of the few people who are actually a landowner that have weighed in on this deal. Uh, I oppose the bills for lots of reasons. First of all, 
the, the tax revenue generated by the counties is enormous. The drain on social services, road maintenance, schools, emergency, they're pretty minimal. I just experienced the construction of one here on our operation this year. And there were very few drains on that. There weren't any problems with the highways. Uh, there's no use of water. I don't see the, the demand there that, that is being talked about. Second of all, let's talk about wildlife. Wildlife has actually increased under our turbines and around the ranch. I've seen more moose, elk, deer, and antelope than I've ever seen before. And my predecessor, Ann King, was a counter and spotter for both Audubon Society and Wyoming Game and Fish Department. <clears throat> In 13 years prior to her passing, she only found one bird strike on a raptor, one in 13 years. This was confirmed by Fish and Wildlife Service biologists. I thought that was really outrageous. And she said, compared to, and she was an absolute animal lover, compared to bird strikes on highways, transformers and power lines, she said it was almost non-existent. The wildlife have never been affected by it. They, they graze underneath it unmolested, unharassed, and probably, get behind them in the, in the winter with the wind and stand in their shade in the summer. Uh, the revenue that comes in is enormous. And, and I think that probably only 20 to 30 year projects. And if the contracts are well done and well written, the reclamation should be complete and make the thing recontoured to original uh, uh, standards. And I oversee that. I've had some experience in that reclamation work and it has really been exceptional. They've answered and, and address every concern that either we've had or the city Shea has had on their projects. And I think uh, on top of that, you need to think about the landowners that stand to benefit from this. And, and there's lots of ranches that want to bring their kids back. I was able to do that. I brought my daughter, my son-in-law back to, to further this operation. We're not going to end up cut into ranchettes that are the drain on water and social services and all those, those expensive Outlays. University of Wyoming has done some great studies on that. They pr provided that. They printed it out. Those kids came back. We continue to spend all our dollars locally. We buy our food, our groceries, our autos, everything here. We roll that over probably three to five times in the community, depending which uh, economist you speak to. And I think that uh, that really it has little effect on our livestock operation, if any. The cattle don't care. In fact, as you can see by my appearance, which I apologize for this morning, I'm out feeding cows and calves because we're right in the height of calving season. I should be out there taking care of those cattle, but this is important enough for me to come and address. Uh, you've got to be careful killing the goose that lays the golden egg. And I think that uh, I've, I've been involved with the regulations, the siting, the setbacks. I think they're all adequate. I think they're there. And, and I think... Uh, I, I think it's an industry we should support instead of changing the rules of the game like we promised when they first came in. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm willing to answer any questions if anybody on the committee has them. Any questions, committee? Okay, appreciate, appreciate you taking time out of your, your morning chores to join us. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank well, you. you guys have a difficult job to do, so we appreciate the efforts uh, as long as you're well-funded, well-educated, and understand what's going on, give it your best shot. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll admit Christine Mickle. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I hope you can hear me. Good morning. Yes, we can. Great. Um, my, uh, again, for the record, my name is Christine Michael, M-I-K-E-L-L. -L. I'm the president of Enyo Renewable Energy. We're a Utah-based wind and solar developer, and we have projects in development in Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. And back in the, uh, I guess it was in 2009, when you first passed the dollar um, tax uh, I was part of a company called Wasatch Wind, and I think we were the only developer at that time to support that tax. I understand the difficulty that you all are facing today as an elected official in Utah. I understand the difficulties of meeting your budget budgets and, and trying to tax enough so that you don't hurt an industry. 
Um, here in Utah, we're, we're seeing, um, seeing something similar happen. We have uh, Pacific Corps' request for proposal that is out on the street and everybody's preparing their best and final pricing for the utility by April 22nd. And here in Utah, uh, many of us who have projects that are on that short list are going to the counties where our projects will be located in asking for property tax incentives. And what that's done here in Utah is pit county against county. Counties aren't sharing what incentives they're giving to other counties uh, because they're trying to be as competitive as they can to locate those solar projects in their counties. I mentioned that because um, we've been approached by a commercial and industrial customer in the Pacific Core system. And we've been asked to provide them different uh, projects to meet uh, their power needs. We've shared with this commercial industrial customer um, a project, a Utah solar project, a Utah wind project, and our Wyoming solar project in Casper, Wyoming, our DynaSolar project. It's a 240 megawatt solar project that was unanimous, unanimously supported by the Planning Commission, as well as the- Ms. Mickle, we have a problem. Um, so we, we, yeah, our, our microphone and our speaker system has- currently broke down so we're getting IT to come come help so unfortunately we haven't been able to hear your testimony in the room okay thanks energy. The uncertainty these companies face without fail year after year is literally keeping renewable energy companies from coming to Wyoming. We all know Wyoming is, is a, in a world of hurt right now due to the decline demand for coal and the ups and downs of oil, gas, and uranium. If you do a search on the internet and type in Wyoming wind tax, you will see page after page. By the way, I stopped at page 25. Uh, about Wyoming wanting to tax wind and now solar 
all the way back to 2016. So this is nothing new. I know Wyoming has some of the best wind in the United States, but due to constantly improving technology and blades and cells, a developer may not need Wyoming wind to generate the same amount of power as they could in Arizona or New Mexico. If you put, in their, if you put yourself in their shoes, why build in Wyoming when you can go to another state where they actually have tax incentives for renewable energy projects? Let me wrap this up by saying, let's please give wind and solar industries some certainty and not only say no to bills HB0094 and HB0108, but to not even draft these types of bills again next year. I uh, also wanted to make a comment, uh, the Associated General Contractors Association of Wyoming, Katie Ligurski is, we need to clone her because she's all over the place and she's a, you know, she has to be in four places at one time. So she wanted me to convey to you that uh, they are against these bills. I stand for any questions, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? Well, we appreciate you making the trip, joining us here today. Thank you. And I think you sent us an email as well. Did you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, appreciate it. We we read all those. I just can't respond to all of them. I mean, it's a couple hundred a day. So we we appreciate. It. I'm going to stay here in the room. I think there were two others that wanted to testify. Please come forward. Just race each. Actually, you can both sit down, and then yeah, both come up. We got three chairs there. And then, uh, Ms. Delancey, why don't you go first? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee members. Uh, my name is Cindy Delancey, and I am the president of the Wyoming uh, Business Alliance. Before I offer my testimony, I just want to extend my, my personal thanks to you and the entire LSO staff for taking all the steps necessary so we can be here in person today. Our capital looks a little different, but I could tell an enormous amount of work and planning has gone into steps taken so we could be here. And I, I just really want to say thank you to you as, as elected officials, as well as your staff to make this possible for us to be here. So thank you for that. Uh, on behalf of the 300 plus members of the Wyoming Business Alliance, I speak in opposition uh, to these bills. Um, we all know that this has been a long conversation over many years. And uh, I just, I shortened my remarks knowing that time is, is kind of tight this morning, but I was listening very closely the other day in the Minerals Committee, and I know Representative Henderson and, and Representative Gray were there. And in fact, Representative Gray asked a, uh, asked a really important question to our uh, um, agency heads at the Industrial Siting uh, Council. He asked, how many projects are in the hopper? And the response was, there were six. Five of those projects were either wind or solar, and one, one was a, an exciting uh, Trona project on the horizon. But these are the projects that we have in the hopper. This is where our money's gonna come from. And at a point where we are thinking about revenue challenges, how do we broaden our tax base? How do we look for non-mineral revenue? We have this in front of us ready to go. And by seeking to increase the tax obligation by 100% on these projects, make it kind of difficult for them to want to move forward with their development. I was joking with Ms. Choquette the other day about uh, our relationship. I met her back in 2009 when my daughter was in kindergarten. My daughter is now graduating high school and we've known each other through the entire lifespan of my children going through school and, and, and working together on seeing her project come to fruition. Why I share this with, with you is that building these projects and getting them across the finish line are, is hard. The margins are tight. The competition for capital, as far as deploying, are, is extremely difficult. So we need to be thinking of every opportunity we can to not add additional barriers to ways to produce non-mineral uh, revenue. We need to be opening our doors and welcoming these projects because our extraction industry is under regulatory assault. We know that. And uh, wind and renewables will be part of the energy conversation, at least for the foreseeable future. So if we can position ourselves in a way to welcome these projects, benefit from them, uh, none of the testimony have I ever heard anyone from industry say that they're not willing to pay their fair share of taxes. Of course they do. They wanna be good corporate citizens. By, jump, but, but by, by jumping 100% as opposed to an incremental uh, escalation uh, is, is, is something that the business community finds unreasonable. So um, at a time when Governor Gordon has asked us to keep our eye on the ball in his state of the state, 
I ask this committee to do the same. So for those reasons, uh, um, we are opposed to uh, the two bills before you this morning. And thank you for the opportunity to share my remarks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Bill Winnie, Sublet County. Uh, they, they long say that you can take the uh, sailor out of the engine room, but you can't take the engine room out of the sailor. So forgive me, I'm gonna be really simplistic here from my background in engineering. But, uh, you know, you tax coal at the mine mouth. How do you tax wind at the mine mouth? And so, as I see it, the purpose of these two bills is to equalize the tax burden across different kinds of generation types or methodologies. To the extent that you do that, you equalize it. I support the bills. Subject to your questions, thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Winnie? Okay, I think we'll head back online. We're gonna try. And uh, I think we've got, how many more folks that would like to testify? Mr. Chairman, Ms. Michael is still on the Zoom. Her testimony was interrupted when the internet went down. And then I have one additional person with their hand up in the waiting room. Okay, great. Okay, let's see if we can, our technology will take us that far. Good morning again. Good morning. Um, I, I, I really nailed my, testi my testimony. So I, yeah. I think I, <laughs> I made it through. Yeah, nice practice session. All right. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Chairman and, and members of the committee. My name is Christine Michael, and I'm the president of Enyo Renewable Energy. We are a Utah-based wind and solar company with um, projects and development in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Um, like you, I'm an elected official here in Utah and um, I had to have some meetings here to attend. Um, having said that, being an elected official, I understand the difficulties that face, that face you today in your decision. I understand that you want to be able to um, tax industries enough so that you don't run them away and that's a really hard balance. Uh, I do want to share with you that uh, with the initial tax that was imposed uh, in the late 2000s, our company, when I was with Wasatch Wind, was a supporter of that tax. Uh, so, so, we try, so we try to be supportive when we feel like the tax is fair. And at that point, we felt like that amount was fair. And in 2016, we were able to have our Pioneer Wind Project be built with that tax. And, uh, and then in 2020, uh, with a partnership with Nextera, the Roundhouse Project, which I developed with Nextera, was built in 2020. Um, I agree with many of the points of those who have already um, made, uh, but I wanted to offer you perspective of the competition that I see from Utah. Um, being based in Utah, and as I mentioned, having projects in, in Wyoming, we recently had in June a, a solar project of ours approved by the Natrona County Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners unanimously. It's a 240 megawatt solar project. We're excited um, because we do have a commercial and an industrial customer that's interested in looking at the Dino Solar Project. However, that same commercial and industrial customer within the Pacific Core system is also interested in looking at the prices of a Utah solar project and a Utah wind project that we have. And I wanted to share with you some of the tax incentives that we have in Utah, which will make our dinosaur project difficult to compete with our Utah solar and even our Utah wind project. In Utah, we do not have sales tax on equipment, renewable energy equipment. We have a refundable tax credit for the first three years. Uh, many of the counties in Utah provide property taxes, tax exemptions. And in fact, because of the Rocky Mountain Power RFP that's ongoing right now, counties in Utah aren't even sharing with other counties what those tax uh, reduction percentages are because they wanna see these solar projects located in their counties. We also have the alternative energy um, and development incentive. And today in our Utah legislature, a high cost infrastructure tax credit was just passed, which can be used for transmission lines and substations in Utah. So for me, I'm fortunate because I have a project 
both solar and wind in Utah and a Wyoming solar project that I can try to sell to this commercial industrial customer in the Pacific Core system. However, when taxes are discussed, um, looking at solar to be taxed one or $2, you can see based on the competition in just your next door state that things are tight. And then I will we'll end with um, just sharing with you some figures. In Utah, uh, the cost of wind is under $30 around 27 or $28. The cost of Wyoming wind is about the same. And so when Rocky Mountain Power is looking to site wind and solar projects, they'll go to the state and the project with the cheapest power. And so I just wanted to share that with you. I love Wyoming, I love working there. I'm excited about my Daniel Solar Project in Natrona County. I know the county commissioners are excited about those revenues, um, but I do fear that when these um, discussions about increasing the tax for both wind and solar at the one to $2 level could hurt your chances. And as an elected official, I share this because I know that you have a difficult balance trying to get as much as you can for your citizens while keeping an industry in your state. So I thank you very much for your time today and I'm here to answer questions. Questions, member. My question really with Utah, you know, and we have this You've mentioned the tax credits. So the credit must be against the corporate income tax. It's like 5%, close to 5% in Utah. Um, it's actually a straight refundable tax credit. So it's not really even against the corporate tax credit. So we get 35 cents uh, per kilowatt hour back and it's a refundable tax credit. So we don't have to show income against that, if that makes sense. Oh, so that's a credit against your income tax. We actually know. So for every megawatt hour uh, we generate, we get 35 cents and then they write a check. The state of Utah writes us a check for that amount. I see. And then, okay, so so you get that incentive, but you do pay then your corporate income tax. And then how about the property tax? I mean, it is a, you mentioned these are, the counties have the ability to kind of incentivize people to come to their county through zoning and tax breaks. I mean, do those go to zero? I mean, because Utah's tax industrial property tax rate commercial it's not quite double wyoming but it's certainly 70 sure. percent higher in ours so a, a 300 megawatt project i'm working on in emory county utah which is you know our, our equivalent i would say of glen rock you know where our coal plants are um, that 300 megawatt project would bring in about 30 million dollars over the life of the project and we're working with that uh, county about for a 50 percent tax incentive so reducing that by about $15 million. Uh, in some counties in Utah, in Northern Utah, we've received uh, property tax exemptions to the tune of 67 and 70%. And same with Southern Utah. And then that would put about in line with our current, I think uh, our current property tax rate. I mean, it's that's the, the issue, you know, we got all these, these differences. So it's part of that, how we incentivize and do that. And I know, I mean, if, our lowest taxes were the incentive. I mean, we'd be the we'd be the most uh, prosperous folks everywhere. But it's interesting. We have some disincentives too. I think that uh, important that we got to keep learning about and studying. Okay. Well, sorry for that diatribe, but I really appreciate you joining us. I think Representative Gray has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so a little bit. Let's think a little bit about this. And and has there ever been a discussion about diverting a portion of the, the county, the existing property tax revenue to the state. You know, it's a little bit, we, you know, you think about the equivalent of the severance tax to fossil fuels. I mean, I just think that would be one strategy and I'd be curious what your feelings would be on that. And I emphasize the existing property tax on these projects solely. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, I, I don't know that I'm the best person to answer that question um, on behalf of, you know, from the county's perspective. I know one of the reasons why they were so supportive of our Dino Solar project was because of the property taxes. I'm not sure that if some of those were diverted to the state, how they would feel about that. I, I apologize. Pretty full room here, I think. Guys with their little brown badges. Um, well, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we have one more. 
Mr. Chairman, we now have two people in the waiting room with their hands up. I'll admit the first, Spencer Haynes. We are going to work these bills today, so we're getting close. Okay, good morning. Please introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Chairman Harshman and uh, members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? We can. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, I've, I've grown adept to testifying <laughs> via Zoom, but uh, you never know when there's a glitch. Um, I, I work for Duke Energy Renewables. Um, we are a subsidiary of Duke Energy, which is a Fortune 150 company. Uh, we operate about 40, 50. I'm sorry, we didn't get your name. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, sir. I'm Spencer Haynes. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. And I work at Duke Energy. We're a diversified electric utility uh, holding company. And I specifically work in our renewables development group. But we also operate um, one of the largest nuclear fleets in the country, uh, as well as uh, coal, gas, um, some of the largest pumped hydro facilities in the, in the world, and a growing renewables business. In fact, we started our renewables investment right here in Wyoming um, with Campbell Hill and Happy Jack, Silver Sage. And um, we're very, very proud of those projects that we did in the 2008 to 2010 timeframe. Um, we made those investments and we're really proud of those um, facilities. I know the community is proud of those facilities. And um, as we grew our renewables footprint, we had to compete and figure out where we were going to invest dollars across the country. And um, we have not made any new investments in Wyoming uh, since because of the business uncertainty that's been created by, um, frankly, the generation tax that was added um, several years ago. Um, and that business uncertainty, I think, has grown even more important over time because wind and solar, um, really because of federal subsidies, have become so much more economic over time. Um, in fact, um, the subsidies for wind and solar are being phased out and um, Duke Energy supports the phasing out of those subsidies. Um, and, it's, and it's worked. It's allowed wind and solar to stand on, its, on their own two feet and, um, and compete and provide um, some, of the, some of the most cost-effective clean energy available now. Um, we have invested about $4 billion since um, the generation tax was added here in Wyoming. And we've done that in other states because um, they were a little more competitive than, than Wyoming was. And when we do that, we, you know, we do that with mixed emotions because we started here in Wyoming and because um, we've got to find the best deal for our customers as well. Um, we always want to be good corporate citizens. We, you know, we've paid our share of the taxes that we are required to here in Wyoming. And um, I'm here today to testify against the proposals to increase the generation tax. Um, I think it's important to realize that Wyoming is not just competing with Colorado and uh, maybe Montana, but it's competing with um, California and Oklahoma and, and um, Kansas and other states where um, there are large amounts of land and a pretty, um, um, a pretty straightforward interconnection to the grid. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to testify um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, very good. Appreciate you joining us. Questions, members? Okay, Mr. Haynes, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'll admit Phil Cornella. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Good. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Just to introduce yourself and who you represent. And yeah, thanks for uh, giving me the time to uh, talk to you a little bit. Uh, uh, my name is Phil Cornella. Um, I'm the apprenticeship coordinator for the uh, International Union of Operating Engineers um, for Wyoming. Um, just the Choke Cherry uh, Sierra Madre project. We have uh, multiple apprentices and members uh, that have had pretty steady work for the, for the last number of years. And uh, 
possibly um, good steady work for, for years to come. Um, I think that if uh, the taxes on um, wind generated energy continue to go up, um, it seems kind of clear to me after listening to everybody uh, that uh, it could make Wyoming uh, just simply not cost effective to be able to uh, build these projects here. Um, additional projects uh, will be, will continue to be like being built in other states. Um, it could cost uh, the state of Wyoming millions of dollars um, in revenue, hundreds of construction jobs and hundreds of full-time jobs um, after it's complete. Um, right now, I just think that Wyoming especially can't afford to lose any more jobs. Uh, our economy is already in pretty rough shape. Um, but I, uh, I oppose the, the bill to increase any, any, uh, any taxes on uh, wind or solar generated power. And uh, thanks, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Cornell? Okay, we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks, sir. Okay, any other? Mr. Uh, Chairman, that's, that was the last hand up in the waiting room. Okay, very good. Okay, members, um, um, House Bill 94 has been presented to us. And um, uh, is, there a, is there a motion on this bill? So the bill's been moved. Is there a second? Second. And seconded by Representative Hallinan. Motion by Representative Baker, second by Representative Hallinan. Okay. Members, are there any amendments to this bill? It's a pretty straightforward bill. Any amendments? Okay. Motions on the bill. I see no amendments. Please, please call a roll. Representatives Baker. Aye. Gray. No. Hallinan. Aye. Henderson. No. Jennings. No. Roscoe. No. Sweeney. No. Yen. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, we have three ayes, six noes. The ayes being representatives Baker, Hallinan. Did you vote? No. Mr. Chairman, you said no. Correct. I did say no. Then we have two ayes, seven noes. I'm sorry, sir. Okay, thank you. Motion do pass has failed on House Bill 94. Okay, the next bill for our consideration is House Bill 108, and that's uh, sponsored by the good Representative Hallinan. Would you like to take us through your bill? It's a pretty short, simple bill. That'd be great if you want to go front there and face the committee. <clears throat> You know, and why uh, Doc Allenan's getting ready here, uh, Ms. Delancey, and mentioned, and our staff has done an unbelievable job to get us here. And uh, Speaker Barlow and President Doc Stetter, all the work, we really are appreciative. And we needed this little bit of delay, whether you want to argue about the vaccine or anything else, just to get this work done. And uh, so we hope it'll give each other a little grace on this deal, and maybe we'll learn something and continue to improve the process. So. Appreciate your comments. Okay, Dr. Representative Howland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, uh, I move that we adopt House Bill 108, and I'll give uh, some description of the bill. It's fairly brief. Uh, the bill raises the rate on that's paid per megawatt hour by $1 and that would uh, be, the, the income from that would go to the state uh, general fund. In addition, it will reduce, it will get rid of the $3 uh, 
or the three-year exemption on the first dollar uh, that uh, applies now. Uh, that's really the bill, Mr. Chairman. It raises the rate uh, by $1 per megawatt hour on wind production, and it deletes the exemption for the first three years of wind production. Okay. If I may, I'll just give a brief sure. description of the bill. This bill would increase the money to the general fund by $130 million over the first nine years of uh, the tax being applied. It would increase the amount of income for the counties by 24,800,000. That's the estimated amount of increase. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what is at stake in, these, uh, in this bill. The, uh, the fact that the wind severance tax or not the wind severance tax, if it was equal to the amount of tax that gas pays to produce a megawatt hour uh, is $1.26 for gas to produce one megawatt hour. And it's only $1 tax on the wind generation. Then I would also add that, um, well, I guess that's really about, that's about, about the extent of my testimony, other than the fact that the federal government gives a $25 per megawatt hour subsidy for the production of wind generation. And this bill only would amount to about, oh, about 9% of that $25. So the federal government is providing a huge benefit to these companies. And we're asking for just $1 in recompense for our state for the loss of wildlife that was brought up by one of the gentlemen uh, that gave testimony. And another item of testimony was that the price of doing business in Wyoming needs to be addressed. And we need to charge these companies for the amount of damage that's done to our tourism business and our, our way of life into the future. So with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that you support this bill. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions of uh, Representative Helen and Representative Sweeney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Helen Ann, um, was there any contemplation um, if this moved forward as far as grandfathering uh, any of the existing uh, projects, uh, both on the uh, exemption and to increase the wind tax? Um, with the projects that are already on on target. Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Sweeney, I haven't given uh, that much thought, but uh, if this bill moves forward into the House where we can vote on this issue and debate it, then I think that would be something that we could discuss at that point but I haven't really addressed that issue in this bill or really in relation to this bill up to this point. I think the one other issue that was brought up for an amendment was the, by the one gentleman who, who spoke, uh, said that 10% of the income could be devoted to the investigation of the effect on wildlife. And I would think that would be an amendment that I would consider, you know, should it be, uh, should this bill get into the floor and, and come up for a vote? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Representative Howland. Any other questions, uh, Vice Chair Henderson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the bringing the bill and and, a, and an excellent presentation. <laughs> uh, building on the uh, last question from Representative Sweeney, from your view. Uh, how do you feel if we were to enact this 100% increase? How do you feel that that would play out in terms of 
current pr projects and maybe some people are planning some projects that may be in the permitting process. How do you feel that would, would play out? Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the question was how do, how do I, how would I look, expect this to plan out in terms of, I would think that these companies are going to continue to come to Wyoming. I don't think this $1 tax increase is, is of significant contribution to their cost uh, with the $25 tax subsidy. And I expect that the Biden administration is likely to continue with that. I don't think they're likely to reduce that, even though it costs the federal government about $4 billion a year in tax, uh, tax subsidy for these companies. So I would think that uh, I, would, I, I don't believe it's gonna slow these companies down very much. It might slow them down a little bit when they first address the issue, but I think they eventually will come back. California has a tremendous desire for wind and solar power. I think that they're going to have to come to us in the future. Uh, I wouldn't rule out the fact that this $1 increase could be increased further yet in the future to face uh, the demand that's gonna be on Wyoming and other states for wind power. So I really think this is gonna have a fairly minimal effect on the amount of industry's reaction uh, to this tax. I think it'd be fairly minimal and very temporary. Thank you, Mr. S Representative Henderson. With a question, yeah, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that answer. So relative to Wyoming's competitiveness, we heard testimony on our competitiveness relative to other state. How do you feel this would impact our competitiveness if, if it would? Representative Hallen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Anderson. Uh, I think there's gonna be a general, all, uh, the rising tide will float all the boats in this case. I think the tide is for uh, these renewables and I think it will rise. Maybe our competitors will continue to increase their amount of uh, provision of these of this, this power. And I think we will also. So I don't think it'll be a big issue uh, relative to other states. If, if Utah wants to give a tax subsidy, I say, go ahead and do it. I don't want to do that from this, from my standpoint. I don't want to see them, uh, I don't want to see our tax, tax base eroded by giving tax subsidies here in the state. And I think that we can afford to, to wait for the, for the rising tide to raise the boats. And I think it will. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Representative Hallinan? Representative Yim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hallinan. So I think we heard one piece of testimony that said one project was decided by a 40 cents per megawatt um, choice between two different bids. And so clearly a dollar per megawatt would change that calculus. Um, and I know that the, the big wind project that was discussed at the beginning of this was a big project in Rollins. Do you think that project will continue or do you think this project would not continue if that wind tax was put in place to the point that Rollins would lose the project and not have any of these jobs that were planned for it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Yen. Uh, the Rollins project, I think, is under construction now. Am I not right? I don't know for sure, but I think it is. I don't think they're going to discontinue a project that has already spent a lot of money uh, to build. So I don't, uh, speaking on that particular project, I don't know the details of it, but I believe that it is under construction and they've spent a lot of money on it already, and I don't think it's going to hurt that that project. Thank you. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Okay. 
Very good. Appreciate you, <clears throat> your presentation of the bill. And I think if you want to return here, we're going to work this bill. And I just want to ask members of the public, we've taken a lot of testimony on both these bills. If there's anybody really feels the need, they just have to have not testified yet on this specifically. Uh, we'd certainly uh, like to hear from you. Um, but I really appreciate all the public comment we've received on both sides of this issue. Mr. Chairman, we have a hand up in the Zoom waiting room. Okay. I'll admit Kara Choquette. Did we already hear from Ms. Choquette? We did. Um, I believe she wants to testify on this bill. Okay, if she has just like maybe an answer to one of those questions that were posed, that'd be great. Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge me, I thought since our project was mentioned, if you'd like me to answer that question, I would be happy to. Yeah, why don't you give us the update where you're at? You have roads and pads and some infrastructure, but are towers built yet? Uh, so thank you again for the question, Mr. Chairman. We did start construction in September of 2016. We've been employing Wyoming workers. We've been spending money in the community. We've been contributing to Wyoming sales taxes through the equipment and supplies and services um, uh, that we buy and that we use on the site. But as I testified before, a, a proposed project is not a certain project. We are highly unusual among all wind projects in the country that we as a company have taken on this risk to start not only the project development back in 2008, all of the permitting costs on our own, but also to start construction. We do not, we have been very actively working to compete and be selected in the Westwood energy markets, submitting in RFPs, submitting documents, but uh, we have not yet been selected. And I have testified to this committee before, our project will be built if the project economics are favorable. Whether or not the project is built depends on all of these cost questions we're talking about today. We also have testified before that, um, if the project economics don't work out, we will not throw good money after bad. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, anyone else? Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Is there a motion on the bill? Representative Hallinan moves the bill. Second. Seconded by Representative Baker. Okay, members, let's work through the bill. I think there was a question earlier about a, you know, application of projects. I think that's in section three is addressed. Uh, you can, you can see the bill really is on page two lines four through six, the dollar. And you can see the repealer on lines 17 through 19 on page two. Um, are there any amendments to the bill? Any amendments? Okay, seeing no amendments, I think we're ready to take uh, take the vote, take the roll. Representative Baker. Just one second, I had a question. Oh yeah, no, we, we discussed it. You wanna make amendments? Sure. You wanna make a comment on your vote? Okay, yeah, I'll open up comments by the committee members if you wanna explain your vote a little bit before we take our vote. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think this is an important bill, and, and when we heard testimony about it, I've tried to keep an open mind, and I think that I have kept an open mind. Um, you know, there's no doubt that uh, this bill has faced opposition and will continue to face opposition. I'd love to see the discussion continue. We've done things like tax capacity studies for other industries and for our state as a whole, <clears throat> and what I'd like to see is you know, we've had a lot of discussion with other uh, about other states. I'd love to see a tax capacity comparison related to this. I think we're really going to struggle, though, because the, there's a lot of ambiguity in how, you know, assessments and valuations are, are, are really determined. But for me, um, this really is it, it's 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 troubling to me because, uh, you know, if we take a strong armed approach where we're not going to do anything with this industry, I think we're going to find ourselves in the same position five years from now where um, as we've heard testimony, um, you know, the, the impacts aren't fully known from, the, from this uh, development in this industry. I would love to see our state actually move forward with this because I don't think the federal government is moving backwards. And when we talk about diversification and things like that, it's, it's, it's a little disappointing to me that, that you know, that, that we can't carry that conversation and that, 
uh, that that forward on on this issue. So I would love to see this uh, this bill move forward. I think it's a good idea. I think if if we were to talk about tax capacity, as Representative Hallinan said, I think there's more than a dollar there. There's this is a really something that could be absorbed very easily, um, you know, and I think that with the continued federal government and subsidies and, and the increase in those, uh, it's just going to be easier to do business in this area. Thank you. Mr. Okay, Chair. thank you. Representative Baker, any other members want to make any comments? Okay, there's a motion. Second. So we'll go ahead and take roll now on House Bill 108. Motion is due pass. Representatives Baker. Aye. Gray. No. Hallinan. Aye. Henderson. No. Jennings. No. Roscoe. No. Sweeney. No. Yin. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, once again, we have two ayes, seven noes, the ayes being Representative Baker and Representative Hallinan. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, the next bill for our consideration is uh, House Bill 180, and that is sponsored by Representative Yen. Mr. Chairman, thank you, members of the committee. I bring before you House Bill 180, property tax deferrals. So you saw this as an amendment earlier in our session um, to House Bill 99. I present it to you not as a replacement for House Bill 99, but as a backup. So we could pass as a legislature, both House Bill 99 and House Bill 180, where House Bill 180 would be a backup in case the court decides that House Bill 99 is unconstitutional if it ever gets challenged. So um, you, you saw most of the language before, it's basically the same. Um, it presents a deferral if your uh, um, assessment jumps by more than 50%. So it, it's actually if your taxable value jumps by more than 50% in a way where it's um, not based on any improvements or any other changes that you made that increase the assessment. It was just the property tax went up because land value went up. Um, and it only applies specifically to principal residences and commercial property. Um, and the deferral program happens uh, by deferring a portion of the increase um, that changes by 20% over a course of five years. So five years, your property taxes will increase by 20% each time until it gets to the regular assessed value. And then over the course of another 10 years, um, you pay back the deferral from the first five years. And um, this, this way it still makes the county and towns whole um, while still keeping the problem of in both Natrona County and Teton County where assessment values jumped up by huge increases and people got surprised and to the point where you risk kicking people out of their homes. And so this, this helps mitigate that impact. And again, it would really only, if, if we passed both House Bill 99 and House Bill 180, it wouldn't take effect with House Bill 99 in place um, because that cap would be increased below 50% anyways. But if House Bill 99 ever got removed um, either in a court of law or by the legislature in the future, they would still have this deferral program to back into um, to help keep that problem from happening again and, and help keep people in their homes. So um, I think that's, that's really the, um, the gist of the bill. I, I, I did have a couple questions from members that asked what would happen um, if it jumped in two years, two separate years, while you still have the deferral program in place, what would happen? And the answer to that is that both increases can be deferred. So if it, I, I think if your property value increased by more than 50% in two years within five years, that is very problematic, um, but this program would still catch it to the point you could defer both of those. Um, it would be a little bit extra math for the treasurer, um, but I think it would still help our constituents um, to keep them in their homes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'm, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Yen. I, I want to thank you. I really appreciate what you what you said and the way you presented this. I, I do think they can work together, and and so thank you um, 
for that. Wanted to ask you a couple questions. Um, you know, I, I do personally think this is constitutional, but because of the uniformity, I think someone could make an argument that a deferral is not um, an assessment. I think it would be thrown out, but what do you think about making the language similar to House Bill 99, where it's any, just for the uniformity issue, um, it's anything in category three in, in, as laid out in the Wyoming state constitution, rather than just saying residents or commercial I'm not seeing that language, and I do think that 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 uh, helps us in the constitutional argument. I, I do believe it's constitutional as drafted. I just think it uh, I just think it makes our case even stronger. So thanks. Okay, what, Mr. Or, Chairman, um, Representative Gray. So it's on page two, lines uh, ten through twelve. Um, restricts it specifically to principal residence and commercial property. We actually have a couple of deferral programs already that. Um, uh, some people don't use currently, um, uh, but have similar language to this and, and do restrict it to residences. So um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm open to any amendments. I think there's a lot of parts that we can tweak to the bill if we so choose as a committee, um, but I don't think it's necessary um, for any, any constitutional questions um, to include all types of property under class three. Okay, any further, any? Uh, Representative Sweeney has a question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Representative Yen, I, I think this is a great tool, um, and I, I don't view it as a, a backup plan. Um, I think both bills um, could or should move forward. Um, my only issue uh, from Natrona County standpoint is um, the deferral really doesn't, I mean, in, in Teton County's case, this could really keep folks uh, in their homes. And, and I agree, it, it also could keep people in their homes um, uh, in Natrona County too. The problem that I, only problem I see with this, it doesn't cap that increase and you've still got to pay going forward uh, the deferred amount and possibly, you know, in, in especially Teton County's cases um, where these wild swings um, in increased value because of sales, um, you may not catch up on your deferral until you die. Um, and um, it, and the way I read this is that the case, um, so I pass away, and then that's passed on basically to um, whoever it's left to, the property's left to. Representative, yeah. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. It it is a deferral that's attached to the property. Um, there there is language specific to to the taxpayer, um, but it still ends up attached to the property. So if you pass it on, it, it, the deferral is still attached to it. Um, I, I think the question about why isn't there, that it's still not a cap. So that's that's the constitutional question that I was worried about with House Bill 99. And, and like I said, if if that constitutional question comes up in a court of law, um, we, we could still have this where it doesn't have the same constitutional question attached to it, just in case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Representative Baker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just wondering, and, and just for clarification, is there any aspect of this bill that's retroactive that goes towards back taxes, Mr. Representative? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think that there is. Um, it is possible that we could make it five years retroactive and then like they could cut into the program at the specific year that is passed from the increase. Um, I'm sure the committee could consider that if they would so choose. I'd be happy to. Um, I was just wondering, Mr. Chairman, because if not, then moving forward uh, with tax sales, it seems like my recollection is, is with tax sales on properties, it takes three years of back taxes before they can actually sell the property. So we wouldn't really be helping anyone for four years from now. So that was just really my question. Representative, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think I would need some help understanding the question exactly. Um, so you're saying, 
I, please, please yeah, let's restate the question. Wait, yeah, Mr. Chairman, and, and I got to, maybe I need to be corrected, but this is the real term me coming out. But my understanding is it takes three years of back taxes before they can do a, a sheriff's sale on, on a, on a, or a, or they can do a foreclosure on the property based on the taxes. So we, with this bill, if this is implemented, it would take three, four years of back taxes moving forward. And then we wouldn't really be helping anybody until four years from now. I think you could defer though, couldn't you right now instead of- Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I would love to get um, some other input from other stakeholders if they could answer that question. Anybody have any thoughts on that on the committee? Well, I think- okay, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sorry. sorry. But just I, I think my question was more around keeping people in their homes as opposed to the deferment. Right, gotcha. Okay, Representative Sweeney. So I think, and Ixie's back back there, but um, I, I think on the uh, tax sale, the counties are made whole, whole by those right up front. Um, but is it three years or five years, Dixie, on a, on a tax sale? Just... Uh, was it three or five? Five. Five years. Okay. Okay. So, um, in in that, um, uh, I I think uh, Representative Yen's bill um, uh, with the deferral pro program, the way I read it, I think protects. Um, on on the deferral tax, but I I, I think Representative Baker um, brings up a good point. I'm not quite sure on that five year um, uh, time period on the on the tax sale, but the way I also read this, the person's still paying property tax. Um, it's just that. Um, the deferred amount. So I don't know how the counties exactly would treat that if there is truly going to be a tax sale. So I'm, I'm just not sure. And maybe when we go to public comment, Ms. Huxbrook, any other questions of the sponsor? Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Ian, I, I really appreciate what you're trying to do here, I think. But I have a, a couple of, I'm, I'm like Representative Baker down there. So as I read through this and I'm thinking, you know, it's highly unlikely that this would occur, but say you had a 51% increase and it, so it kicks in and the next year you had a 52% increase. This looks like just a credit card um, issue that we're, we're going to allow them. So say it went up by a thousand dollars just for simplicity of, of the question. But then the next year, that $1,000 and another $1,000, and, and it, it almost seems like it becomes a thing of a, a credit card where it's building. Do you see the, the issue there with it? Can you address some of that a little bit in a little more depth? Because it looks to me like, say you had three years of heavy tax increases, and then maybe not. But now you're, you're piling on three deferrals. I mean, I'm assuming that's what it looks like. Is that correct? Representative Yen? Mr. Chairman, that, that would be correct. So if we do the math, um, we'll start with the thousand dollar is your, your baseline tax property tax payment, right? And it increases by $501. So your, your new tax is 1,501. You defer the 501% over the course of five years. It increases again by another 51%, we'll say 51%. So that's another $752, let's say. So your, uh, you can defer that additional $752 um, over the course of five years. So yes, you, you have an increased amount that you will owe in the following 12, 16 years, um, but it's still amortized over that 10 year period to pay back the deferral as well. Ideally, um, if, if the counties are doing their job, uh, that should not happen. You should not have to deal with a 50% plus increase in multiple different years. 
that would be a, that would be very problematic, but at least the deferral program in place would still be able to handle it. Okay. Any follow up on that or any anybody else? Okay. Are we ready for public comment? Other quick question. Okay, Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and thank you, Representative. Mike, for bringing, bringing it. This is an important bill, if you think about it. Uh, supplementing, like, like uh, was talked before, about the, what we have in place and how can we make that better in terms of keeping folks in their home. My question is, Mr. Chairman, if, if someone continues to qualify and meet the, the, or the qualifications or the requirements of the terms for the deferral, there would be no limit on the number of deferrals. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Henderson, so there is one thing um, in the bill that uh, maybe I didn't mention in the uh, in going over it is that the taxpayer does have to apply to the county commissioners um, and, you know, they are elected officials. So ideally, they, they um, want to help their constituents as well. But if it comes to the point where you have uh, um, 50 percent increases over over uh, for each year for several years, um, then it, it may be problematic for the commissioners, I, and, and then it becomes a balance of of um, uh, of pros and cons with the commissioners to decide whether they want to continue this for a taxpayer to do it for several years in a row. But again, like I said before, it would be very problematic if that was actually happening in a county where you have a taxpayer with a change in assessment of more than fifty percent in several different years. Probably more likely a meteorite take us out for that but is there any other questions and if there is we got serious assessor problems no doubt about it okay i think we're going to move to public comment and I, and we have three chairs up here so if there's more than one come on up and then we can even be more efficient as we keep on rolling so come on up just have a seat looks like you're all by yourself <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Lori Urbekite representing the Wyoming Realtors, and we appreciate Representative Yen's um, efforts on this. Obviously, the um, serious increase in, in um, the tax bills for a lot of homeowners in some areas of our state have been have been critical. Um, so, so we were excited to look at this. We've actually discussed this type of program before and thought, how could that work? How could we make this? How could it help? Well, unfortunately, um, every time I get very deep into it, I would remember when I started in real estate, which was a long time ago, but I sold new construction in the 80s, in the early 80s. And then there was the crash. And then I went and got a real estate license so I could be paid on commission. And every other home in our town, literally in the, in the new construction area that I had originally sold in, was a HUD foreclosure. foreclosure. So what happens when people, I mean, if the market goes down, if the market goes south and they have no equity and they have to sell, and most of these houses are 95% mortgage to loan to values, they don't have room to add a thousand or 2000 or even a $500. Back in, in the late eighties, early nineties, we had, we had sellers that would have to bring their checkbooks to closings. And if they have not paid their taxes all along, it's only going to be worse. It's not going to get better. And we have, so year to date, or um, year over year, we have seen an increase in real property, in residential real property values around the state, anywhere from 12 to 10% kind of has been where it's been at. Now I know there are hotter areas and, and then there are areas that, that haven't seen that much increase, but that's kind of an average. Where are you seeing that slowing down substantially? Substantially, it's down to around five to six percent in a lot of areas, and so it's not going south yet. But it's certainly not the market it was. And if it does go south, and if we continue to have the job losses that we've had in the mineral industry and oil and gas, I have serious concerns. Without a cap, this could work with a cap, but without a cap, I'm afraid we're not really doing people a lot of favors. We're we're going to make life really difficult when those houses have to be sold. And they're going to wind up in foreclosure instead of being sold because they can't sell them or there'll be short sales either way. 
And Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. I haven't really dug through the whole bill. Um, I have a concern about if um, you have a mortgage on it, 99% of the time, a, um, a percentage of your taxes, tw one twelfth of your taxes is added to your monthly payment. And so I'm not sure how the mortgage companies are gonna deal with this. Um, whether they would understand that we have a deferral program and so your payments would be lowered. I'm, I'm not real clear how the technical part would work, but I, but I am concerned. I mean, I appreciate the concept, but without a cap on it, I'm really concerned that we are not gonna really be doing people favors to, at the end of the day. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir, okay. Uh, Vice Chair Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again in person. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. So when you're, you're talking about the need for a cap, have you any idea how such a cap would be maybe calculated? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I was referring to the bill that was passed out of this committee last week, week before last, right. whenever it was, we, we did that. Um, and, I, and I'm comfortable with that 20% cap because as I said, I mean, maybe there are areas that have had appreciations much higher than 20%. But for the most of the state, that's going to take into account your average appreciation on real property. It's around 10 to 12 percent. I mean, in our good years, in our good years. So, so that 20 percent cap, I'm real comfortable with. Go ahead. Follow up. So, just to be clear, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to be clear, then it's it's as simple as just picking a number, or or do we do, do we want to look at other things like what? What's going on in that particular community? And we have different, as you know, different economic situations across the state. Mr. Okay. Chairman, and, and I, I do understand that. No, it's not as simple as picking a number, quite, quite frankly. Um, we look at the average appreciation across the state. And, and I, I think you'll hear that there may be areas that are appreciating more than 20%, but very, very few. So if we cap it at 20, and then we have this deferral system. I think the two bills could work together, quite frankly. Um, I think I've got to dig in a little deeper, but um, without the cap, I don't think this bill works. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you, you for Mr. joining Chairman. us. Appreciate you being here today. Any other folks would like to testify on House Bill 180? Mr. Raymond. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. I hadn't intended to testify because we haven't established a position on this. We won't do that till Monday for this last wave of bills. But I, I did want to at least note one thing that I think is worth consideration. And, and uh, I've noted this to Representative Yen. And it kind of goes to Representative Gray's concern about constitutionality. I'm not so worried about uh, whether this is unconstitutional and the ability to offer a deferral program. I think where there's the potential for it to become unconstitutional is if in that discretion uh, that the commissioners have, they ununiformly uh, apply uh, the deferral. Um, so what I mean there is that, uh, let's just say Representative Roscoe comes in for a deferral and we deny him on you know, whatever arbitrary grounds and uh, represent Baker comes in and we grant it uh, and their cases are similar. Um, we should be uniformly applying uh, the approach here. And so uh, I don't know if that demands uh, a, an amendment to the bill uh, on page uh, four, where it talks about uh, the promulgation of rules. Uh, maybe it's uh, an amendment on uh, lines uh, or on line 17 of page four that would call for the uniform administration uh, of such a program. Um, so just something I bring forward uh, to you uh, uh, as a consideration. We'll get you our position once we establish that next week. I think we are at least more uh, neutral from my perspective on uh, this particular approach. Okay, very good. Any questions, Mr. Rima? Okay, thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah, Representative Gray has questions. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do want to, you know, there's two kind of issues here, and I think while House Bill 99 on uniformity 
even with your amendment, I think House Bill 99 is stronger on uniformity because it's very clear it applies to every single and it's it's a it's a 20% factor is currently drafted. Um, this one, even if you you do that amendment, there's still discretion. You know, you're just saying in the bill uniformly apply the rules. Well, what does that mean? I mean, they're they're still given discretion in the bill, right? I mean, you could remove all of the discretion and just say anyone can get this automatically. I'm not reading that here um, because it's all May. So I don't think uniformly, you know, I don't think that amendment really does totally fix that issue depending on how it's done county by county. Um, you know, on uniformity though, I still think that I just want to make that point on the uniformity point. I think how HB 99 is stronger, even with that amendment, unless you take away all discretion. And you know, on the assessment point, obviously, um, you can get into the to the nuances of the Constitution, and that doesn't happen here. Well, unless assessment is is payment as definite as the definition, and probably that is not the way you define assessment. So um, anyway, I just wanted to ask. I'll, I'll end it with a question. I mean, would you agree with that that there's still discretion despite your amendment if that's the way we draft it? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, yes, there's discretion in this, and I think that's a good approach. I think you're leaving that to the decision of uh, the commissioners on whether they are going to have a program or not. What I'm suggesting is if they have a program and two individuals come through the door with like circumstances, that we need to treat them the same. Uh, and if we don't, then I think that's an unconstitutional approach. Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up, I know we're short on time, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. I you know, Mr. Mr. Ryman, I, I don't think that, in my opinion, that doesn't quite cut it because it's not just any like person coming through the door. It has to be everybody within that class. OK, so anybody that would um, that would ask for a deferral within that single class, the third class in the Constitution would automatically receive it. Otherwise, I think you have a uniformity issue in this bill that HB 99 does, does not have. And I don't think you can just say uniformly apply the rules. It's got to be everybody that comes through the door in that class, regardless of the percentage increase or whatever, as long as it is over this percentage. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Ray. Representative Gray, I don't know that we're, uh, or Mr. Yeah. sorry, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, I don't know that we're saying much different here. Um, I think we agree that, uh, you know, if there is a qualifying group of individuals that they need to be treated uniformly. What I don't want to have is that my commissioners, and this is something that we would advise them on, uh, would have different approaches for different people coming in the door. Um, it needs to be a uniform set of rules and regulations for how this is going to be administered. I think uh, Representative Jennings has a question, and then Representative Roscoe. Yeah, I'll try to be brief, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I could have asked this of uh, Representative Yen, but I didn't think of it then. So I'm having tried to always stay away from delinquent taxes. Uh, so for my own personal edification, under this deferral, would there be penalty and interest and stuff like that applied to the, the part that's deferred? Or would that be just be foregone? I think that's a question for the sponsor. Representative Yen, you want to? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Jennings, there is no interest. There's no penalty. Um, it's not owed back taxes. It's deferred taxes. So it it is there. there's no penalties associated or interest. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Roscoe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Raman, I just want to make clear <clears throat> to me that is uh, the county is comfortable with um, um not being left out at the end that they will that uh, they will eventually be paid and and uh that eventually that does work out there's no you're comfortable with the fact that you will get your taxes paid to you eventually mr Riemann. mr chairman representative roscoe as i mentioned i haven't debated this uh, bill with my members so that it will be upcoming uh, and i think that that's why the discretion is important uh, for those counties that feel comfortable uh, and maybe they have a few reserves so they can weather uh, those sorts of deferrals that they would have a program and that those that couldn't wouldn't but i also think that this isn't just about 
the counties, uh, because remember, my members uh, and uh, the other elected officials at the local level are collecting on behalf of a much larger group, including schools and special districts. We're frankly uh, such a small part of that 12 to 17 percent, depending on the county that you're in. So I think we all collectively have to be comfortable with this approach uh, and, and granting that authority at the local level. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions for Mr. Raymond? Okay. Thank you for your testimony today. Any other members of the public would like to comment on this bill? Why any testimony? Okay. I don't see anyone rushing the podium. Okay. Appreciate you all being here today. And members, we have a few minutes. We're going to, they'll hold the roll open for us. I'd like to knock this bill out if we can. There's a motion on the bill by Representative Sweeney. Second by Representative Yen. Okay, let's start working through the bill page by page. Okay, we'll flip over to page two. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment on page Representative two. Representative Gray. I'd like to strike line 10 through 11, starting at the word the and line 10 through the word property in line 11. So the seven words we're striking is the owner's principal residence or commercial property. Okay, is there a second? And 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 then we're adding in, excuse me, sorry. Oh I, no, I still you had some more. more. It's kind of going slow, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. We're adding in, in place of that, any property in the all other property class, comma, real and personal, comma, identified in paragraph A, Triple I of Article 15, Section 11 of the Wyoming Constitution. Okay. Is there a second? He'll get that to you. Yeah. yeah. I think the committee, does the committee understand that? You want to repeat that again? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're striking in lines 10 through 11, the owner's principal, last three words of line 10, and then in line 11, the first four words, residence or commercial property, and we're replacing it with any property in the all other property class, comma, real and personal, comma, identified in paragraph A, triple I of Article 15, comma, Section 11 of the Wyoming Constitution. Okay. Is there a second? Second by Representative Jennings. Discussion? Representative Mian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we so one of the property tax deferral programs that we have in place is in 3913-107. B Romanet three, um, the eligibility requirements, one, you have to be a senior citizen, but two, it's on principal residence on a parcel of land less than 40 acres. So we already have a deferral program in place that doesn't cover um, all um, other property class. So it doesn't, it doesn't include all of that extra property. Um, so I don't think this is necessary to answer a constitutional question because we already have a program that has never been challenged on that question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> okay, any further discussion, any questions? Okay, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So one thing was the constitutionality and just because something hasn't been declared unconstitutional doesn't mean it isn't, it just maybe hasn't been challenged. And you know that could be because of standing or whatever. Um, but the second reason is that I'm worried that there's some, some properties that aren't being keyed <clears throat> in into this that, that would be, um, I'm not a master in the different classifications and the definition. I just feel more comfortable with this definition because it's more all encompassing than, than the one that we have. So um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Representative Henderson has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, you, you indicated that this was coming from the we, is, is, is the we the collected we, or are you, are you getting information on this from, from some particular uh, organization in the state? Representative Gray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Representative Henderson, I'm sorry, I, Vice Chairman Henderson, I, when did I use we? I, I'm just not remembering. <laughs> I might have just used it. I know, it's been a long morning. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, 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 criticizing. I'm just trying yeah. to clarify the source of your information. Oh, okay. It will help on how you came up with this change. Representative Gray. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just going through the bill. If I used we, I meant I, um, I think. I'll go back and listen to it. Thank you. Okay. Representative Hallinan has a question. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd ask Representative Gray, what, what is the difference between what your amendment has in it and what's on this bill? What's the difference? Representative Gray. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I, I think there's a chance there's an undeveloped property that not necessarily would be defined as commercial and vacant, vacant land that might not be defined as commercial or residential. I'm not a master on that. Um, I think the constitutionality concerns, I think the fact that, uh, I, I just think it's better better language too, because it refers specifically to the constitution. So, I mean, what is the definition of a residence or commercial property? Does that include vacant land? Does that include vacant land that's been zoned in a certain way? I, I'm not a master on zoning, okay? I haven't, I haven't been a county commissioner, but, um, I'm more comfortable with this language because it's the one we use in the other bill. And I, I just am more familiar with it. Okay. Any other questions to the sponsor of the amendment? Okay. Since you're ready to vote on the amendment, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Oh, no. That amendment has failed. Okay. Any other amendments on page two? Page three. Okay, flipping over to page four. Any amendments, Rep. Zemian? Mr. Chairman, I, I'm I'm certainly not opposed to the proposal by the County Commissioners Association. I don't think it's necessarily. I don't think it's necessary because. Of course, our county commissioners take an oath of the Constitution, so they need to obey it anyways. But um, <clears throat> if if a member did want to propose in the promulgation of rules that we ensure uniform administration, I, I, again, I would not be opposed. Are you going to make that motion? I, I will not, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I have it written down, but okay, anybody? All right. Anybody? Okay, on page four, page five. Page six. And page seven, question. question being called on the bill. Question, no amendments. Question being called on the bill. Please call the roll on House Bill 180. Representatives Baker. No. Gray. Aye. Hallinan. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Jennings. No. Roscoe. Aye. Sweeney. Aye. Yin. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have seven ayes, two noes, the noes being representatives Baker and Jennings. Okay, and I we had to, on our meeting notice 176 as time allows and time does not allow. So we will make that the first bill next Tuesday. And then there'll be some other bills added behind it. So we'll just keep rolling them. Okay, thank you all for attending. Members, appreciate your good work.